Well, we, we already got the explanation for the phenomena that I'm going to present now. <laughs> so, uh, but it's um, a very complex situation, as you understand. And um, when one measures, as in this study that um, uh, we both, Anders and I, uh, refer to, uh, where they studied 612 different metabolites, then, of course, the amount of interpretation that you can put upon that, on top of that, is, uh, is great. But there are some uh, patterns, and I will try to, um, to show what really they uh, found. Let's see here. Yeah. This is the paper that we are discussing, Metabolic Features of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. It came out two months ago in PNAS. 84 persons with 45 MECFS patients. And that's a relatively small study, but then each was then studied with many uh, variables, 612 metabolites and it was only plasma samples. So then, of course, one could study things like urine or cerebrospinal fluid, which is um, very relevant for chronic fatigue syndrome, but they only looked in blood, in plasma. Well, here is uh, a view of all these 612 molecules. And you can see that some of them are marked uh, uh, red. And that means that they are uh, highly expressed compared to controls. 1.5 is the highest. And those which are green are, are lower and then the lowest is 0 0.5 times the control. So uh, these are big differences because uh, this, these are basic metabolites which occur in the body all the time and they don't normally vary so much. And this is the pattern for males. You can see that some groups here of metabolites like the sphingolipids are entirely green, or most of them are green. And in other places, there are red dots. If you look at the, um, let's see here, the females, uh, we have a similar pattern with sphingolipids, entirely green, and uh, yeah, some of the red dots here. I marked some places where there are differences, like the glycosphingolipids, and also citric acid cycle here. They're green. And um, some phospholipids, vitamin B12, B2, uh, is also changed. So here you see uh, uh, that some changes are common between males and females. Uh, and some are unique to males and females. And I want to mention the endocannabinoids, which actually are fatty acid derivatives, arachidonic acid bound to um, glycerol, which can influence things like uh, pain threshold, uh, which may be relevant, for example, in um, fibromyalgia. But that remains, to, of course, to uh, investigate. And uh, with all these changes, if one does a, a multivariate analysis, you see that they cluster separately. So that's a pretty clear-cut difference between patients and controls, both for males and females. So that's very encouraging uh, for establishing biomarkers and you see here that among those which are most different from the, um, the rest, those who, so to speak, lead the pack, 
uh, if you want to establish a biomarker are the sphingolipids, the glycosphingolipids. Same for males. And if you use uh, eight uh, metabolites, you, you get an area under the curve for males of 0.94, which is very good. It uh, clearly should be clearly useful clinically. And uh, for females, 0.96 if you use 13 different metabolites. So this is uh, good news for establishing of biomarkers. And uh, I just compare with our own HSP60 peptide, which we established uh, as a biomarker candidate using the Gottfried's ME patients, uh, which has an area under the curve of 0.7. So it's not as clear cut as the Navio. So what, is, what are the strengths here? It's the first large-scale metabolomic study, new angles, new explanatory models, and there is, uh, it gives clear targets for further research. Does it fit with other patient materials or not? And it can be translated into everyday diagnostics. Um, it's not entirely clear why they choose these metabolites, it's unclear if there are confounding factors like physical inactivity. I discussed that with Einstein. Uh, unexpectedly large differences between males and females uh, indicates a heterogeneity among patients. For example, is the proportion of fibromyalgia higher in the female portion? And uh, the small sample size, small numbers here, 20, 22, 25, uh, gives a risk of overinterpretation, of course. So the conclusion is that this is a promising study and diagnostic procedures may arise. It's uncertain how ME specific these changes are, and patients from many different disease categories must be analyzed. It's a task for a clinical chemistry lab. Okay, that's all. Thank you.